Hey guys, welcome to this special Q&A video. We're joined today by Adam from Sheffield, who's come onto the show to share his gambling addiction story with us, specifically around horse racing and Cheltenham Festival. It's the one year anniversary since his last bet. And so if you're watching this video, you're probably wanting to find out what the first few days, weeks and months were like after Adam gave up. To anyone who's experiencing gambling problems, watching this video and would like to reach out for help and support, both Adam and I are available and we've left our links in the description box below. Without further ado, let me introduce today's guest. Adam, thanks so much for joining us today. A massive congratulations on your one year anniversary, free from gambling. How does it feel? It feels great, Alex. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. Um, if you'd have said to me this time last year um, that I'd have been able to go a full year without having a bet, I'd have, I'd have said you're an idiot in the kindest possible way. Um, and I think I'd have, I'd have been well within my rights to say that. Um, you know, uh, this time last year, for the past two or three years, my life revolved around gambling. Um, I woke up, I gambled, I'd go into bed. I was gambling um, and it, it, it was eventually, it turned out to be the root of all my problems. Um, so to get out of that dark place that I was in and, and find some help and find some support and you know, be able to get through the year and get through them difficult days really means a lot to me. And I'm not one for self-praise, um, but I like to think that today's a day where I, I can feel proud of myself and, and hopefully just kick on from here. That's absolutely fantastic. So we're obviously going to dive into your story, but... Before we do, could you give the viewers a brief introduction about your background and experience, where you grew up, what you do for a living, etc.? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So my, um, I'm 23 years old and I'm from Sheffield, which is in South Yorkshire. Um, I've lived here all my life with my parents um, and for a living I work in an opticians as a, a lab technician, which isn't as impressive as it sounds. But I've pretty much done that since I left school, which went from a Saturday job to an apprenticeship. Uh, to a full-time job so I've been doing that for the past six or seven years now and it's a, a nice job um, with some great people and obviously during the the madness of COVID and, and lockdowns and stuff um, opticians are obviously classed as essential uh, key workers so despite being off work um, in the first lockdown for the best part of three or four months um, since around September I've been back in pretty much full-time back to normal which is, is obviously great for mentally and, and just keeping that sanity and and obviously now we've got some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of uh, restrictions easing, which is great. Great stuff. So, Adam, gambling, how did it, uh, how did it start for you? Sure, yeah. So um, I probably first started gambling when I was around 15, 16, um, which is obviously a couple of years under the legal limit. But uh, there wasn't really any harm in what I was doing. Um, this wasn't a case of, you know, like sneaking into bookies illegally or... Um, making accounts under fake names, that sort of thing. It was merely just giving my dad a couple of quid on the weekend um, to have a, have a little go on the football. Football was, as I'm sure it is with a lot of lads growing up, was my number one sport, uh, following Sheffield Wednesday and going home and away matches. So I, I really liked football and um, getting involved with a little bit every couple of weekends with a stake of, you know, no more than a fiver was, was my way of, of fun. And even if, if the bet won, you know, it would um, pay for a night out or it would... Uh, you know, pay for a few more bets, but if the bet lost, it wouldn't have a financial impact on me in that sort of way. And that was, I guess, when gambling was enjoyable and responsible. And honestly, I kept that up for the best part of two or three years. And it wasn't even the case of counting down the days till I got to 18 so I could get in the bookies or I could set my own account up. It didn't grip me in that way. Um, and, and like I say, I kept up that responsible approach. And not only that, a sort of mature approach, I like to think that I was aware of the dangers. Um, I knew just how quickly from reading of stories online and uh, videos of how quick it can get out of control. So I was aware of that, hence why I kept the stakes so low and I was uh, managing, you know, how often I bet. And it was only when I discovered horse racing um, as a sport when I was um, around 19 um, up here in, in Yorkshire, we have um, a festival at the Doncaster Racecourse called the St. Ledger. Um, and it was in 2019 where me and my parents got some tickets for that event and I was completely unaware of the sport really obviously I knew it existed but I'd never watched a race I didn't have a clue about how it worked um, and we'd got the tickets a few months in advance so I wanted to pretty much make sure that on the day I wasn't completely alien to what was going on and um, so I tried to get a bit of a background of the sport 
um, you know, tried to research it, do some studying of races. Bearing in mind, I wasn't even gambling on these races at, the, at this point. And if I was, it was, again, you know, really low stakes. Um, it was just, as I say, to get an idea of the sport. And, and cut a long story short, I found that I was gaining quite a, a good bit of knowledge about the sport um, in what was, I felt, quite a short space of time. Um, obviously still quite new to gambling at this point, especially on a more, on a more regular basis. Um, and it kind of took me by surprise in the sense that I'd uh, stumbled across this sport and I was all of a sudden backing these winners at, at quite nice prices, uh, what I thought. So I, again, started following the sport much more. The St. Ledger came around and I was able to back a couple of winners on that day. And uh, again, cut a long story short, I found that over the months I was able to I've gained a really good understanding of the sport, which then came with the um, previews and I took to social media, et cetera, and started doing some previews of races, um, which was initially shared with just my friends. Um, and, and this wasn't really for their benefit. It was more for my benefit because I was enjoying it so much. And, and again, I wasn't really gambling at this point. It was just the thrill and the enjoyment of watching the sport and looking at a race and, and, and picking you know, being able to pick a winner and knowing that I'd studied that race for the best part of, you know, a couple of hours sometimes. Um, and I think it was that buzz and that enjoyment from it that, that then came with the gambling. And I decided that I'd been able to, you know, get such a, a good understanding of the sport that I'd begin to back myself. Um, and I'd, as I said to, at the start, I'd been working since I was 15, 16. So I had quite a, a good financial um, budget at this point. So, I could, you know, start depositing a bit more money and, and taking it a bit more seriously, if you like. Um, and that went really well. And I, I started up in the stakes and I started winning, like, serious amounts of money. And uh, like I say, in what was quite a short space of time, and it got to the point where I was thinking, why am I even going into work? Like, and that's generally how I thought, because it was going that well and I was winning every day. Um, and it was only from there where I really, really bang it, began to back myself. Um, and I started quite alarmingly up in the stakes, but you know nothing was going wrong in that sense, and everything was going right. So still being quite vulnerable, and you know it, it upsets me looking back, but it was just so easy. Um, so I, I, like I say, I started to up the stakes, and it was where things kind of abruptly came to an end, um, and I started losing money that I didn't really feel comfortable in losing, and that was you know at the time that was all right, um, but it was from there that. I really started to get angry with myself and it wasn't the case of getting angry and, and taking a step back and, you know, looking at the, the bigger picture sort of thing. It was getting angry that I'd lost this money um, and I'd, you know, kind of let my control slip, this control that I'd had for so long. Um, and it was when the stakes, again, began to increase. I began betting more often on races that I hadn't even studied, which was, again, new to me. Um, so I was pretty much betting blind and I was desperately trying to claw back the money that I'd lost and it was only a matter of time before I was losing you know thousands and thousands of pounds money that I'd saved up from being a kid um month, monthly wage being gone um in a couple of days when I'd got paid and it, it, the vicious spiral began um really fast and all of a sudden I found myself in this sort of like a nightmare um and I wasn't really sure what was going on it was all uh, kind of a bit confusing that I'd um you know, use these same methods and, and similar studying of races to get winners. And I was doing exactly the same, but now I couldn't buy a winner. Um, so it was that feeling of, uh, you know, I, as I say, anger almost and, and confusion as to why it wasn't going so well. And that's really when I guess my story begins in that sense. So it sounds like you've been attracted to horse racing, um, you know, by studying the form and mm. doing that research and you've had those initial winners. Um, was it just down to bad luck? That you didn't have, um, that you didn't have those winners. Potentially, yes. Um, and I, I think obviously within gambling, you can go on lucky streaks, you can go on bad streaks, and I was on a particularly lucky streak on this occasion. Um, and don't get me wrong, I took advantage of that in that sense, and I think that's where the, the buzz came from and craving that, craving that winning feeling. And I think it was bound to end. And I deep down, I knew that this streak had to end, and that's when I, I think I sort of kicked myself looking back almost because. I knew it was going to end, but that didn't stop me uh, reining it in and, and, and taking a step back like I spoke about. And, and that is, you know, one of my biggest regrets, especially when I saw these losers, um, you know, all the greens that were on my account were suddenly turning into reds. And I knew that was wrong. And I knew that 
the streak that I'd been on had ended and I should have taken a step back. But again, it was going on that streak for so long that, that meant that I craved that feeling. And, you know, it was an amazing feeling. You can't really put a price tag on being able to study a race for so many hours and then get it right, pretty much get it spot on to how you predicted. And I think it was that from there that really fueled this, this passion almost for the sport, but then gambling got in the way of that. If that, if that makes sense. And that's when uh, things really started to go wrong for me, when that enjoyment that I'd had for the sport for so long uh, began to uh, sort of vanish away. Um, and, and it was then that bad streak that just seemed to go on and on and on. And even when I would get a couple of winners, the money that I'd won would just be lost again. And, and that's obviously when the problems really started to materialise. So what were the, the problems that started to um, materialise at this point? Sure. Yeah. So the problems, as I say, were the enjoyment. Um, it was the, the chasing of losses, something that I'd never really experienced before. And it was, as I say, the emotions and the mood swings and, and not the mood swings that took me away and made me realise what I was doing was wrong. It was uh, more, as I say, angry with myself that I'd let this, this control slip. Um, and again, it was that enjoyment and not enjoying the races like I had done. Um, and then that's when things really started to go wrong financially. I, I, from, as I say, an early age, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be quite tight with my money, to be honest. Um, and growing up around parents that worked so heavily in finance, my mum was um, uh, working in a bank for the best part of 40 years. My dad was a, a mortgage advisor. So I, I knew how important it was to look after your money and respect it and, you know, save it up simply for the future in, in that sort of way. Um, so knowing that I'd lost quite an alarming amount of money in that sort of short space of time. I didn't really know how to, to bring that to them and tell them. So I kept that bottled up. And I think that was another problem materializing that I was suffering quite badly, but in silence. And I couldn't, couldn't speak to anyone about this. I couldn't talk to anyone. And that only made, made things worse because that, was, that brought on this other problem of denial and, and, and kidding myself that the situation I'd got myself into really wasn't that bad. Um, and I just needed another payday uh, to get myself out of it and obviously we all know how that goes at that point and, that, and that's when the payday comes around and you see a bet that's lined up it's a banker and you know the monthly wage has gone before you can even you know think about it and that's obviously again suffering in silence I've got no money to get me through to the end of the month and how do I get to work how do I go on nights out with friends how do I explain this to them that you know I've got no money um, as, a, as a 21 year old uh, so that's when payday loans came into the equation um, and that was my way out which is it, it's so sad saying it out loud but I, I would I'd have this opportunity then to get some money um, and I'd be able to pay it back over a few months but that would get me through the month and that would you know, give me a chance to you know, repair almost the damage that I'd caused um, and again we all know how it goes um, I, I took these loans out with the genuine mindset of paying for travel, paying for food, paying for nights out, living this normal life that, you know, so desperately wanted to live. And, and the money would hit my account and within usually minutes that money would be gone. Um, a feeling of regret, uh, embarrassment, shame, um, but that didn't stop me doing it again. And because and I was, you know, so good with my money growing up, my credit score was, I think, as good as it could be for, for someone of my age. So I just was able to take out whatever I wanted. Um, and I quickly found myself you know, get into a, a spiral of debt, um, setting repayments for the 28th of every month, which is, like I say, my payday. Um, that day would come around. I remember setting my alarm for 4.30 in the morning uh, to get paid, to then transfer that money into my savings account, wake up at 6.30, see that money in my savings, several texts, emails, saying we've tried to collect payments, but we've got no money. I'd transfer that money back into my account. As soon as it hit my account, in the betting account, and I'd lose it all. Um, and that was my life for the best part of two and a half, three years. And that kept up and kept up every single month. But the debts only increased, the loans increased, um, financial damage, uh, mental damage, physical damage. I wasn't going on nights out. I wasn't seeing my friends. Questions were asked. Um, and I was very, very quick to dim them down and, and shut them out. <clears throat> which again, looking back, is something I really regret because they were only looking out for me in that sense. Um, but that was powerful, you know, and that really made me realise when I was getting questions asked that, you know, 
something was really wrong and I needed to snap out of this mindset of denial. Um, but I couldn't do it. I, I simply couldn't do it. And it, it hit away at me and it almost like the walls were closing in um, as, as time went by. Um, and my situation was, was not getting any better to the point where I just gave up. Um, I saw no way out of this. I couldn't even comprehend the fact of talking to anyone about this, you know, not even professional help. So no chance that I'm going to go to my parents or go and talk to my friends. Um, so I so selfishly and purposely made my situation worse, um, almost as like a cry for help in a way. And I was doing stupid things, borrowing money um, with the pure intention now of gambling it. Um, you know, my situation had gone beyond the point of being repaired and I needed something to slip up. Um, I needed something to catch me out. So I would have to explain myself. I'd have to come clean. Um, and somehow I was able to get away with it all this time. Um, and, and it was only, you know, this time last year where um, things really went wrong for me after Cheltenham last year and I was at an all-time low mentally. Um, and that's when, I don't even know how I did it now, but that's when I opened up and that's when I spoke to my parents and it was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Um, but equal to that, it's one of the best things I've ever done. And, and I'm fortunate enough now to be in this position. So... On that note then, Adam, so you spoke about Cheltenham Festival this time last mm -hmm. year being, being, being bad for you. What, um, was, it, was it just a culmination of all the events, the events that you've just described? And um, was, it, was it just a series of bad bets? Or, um, yeah, what, what, what was it that, that made it go so, so wrong? Oh, yeah. Um, so, it's, again, the gambling had, I guess, sort of ruined the enjoyment that I had for the sport. But because I was, I think, so like, attached to it at this point, and I, I still found some some form of enjoyment from it I still watched the sport even though I wasn't gambling on it and I was still somehow able to get enjoyment in this again sort of denial and and, and phase mindset that I was in um so Cheltenham came around and I was still watching the races and I'd managed to save a bit of money put, put a bit of money to one side even though that money should have been going towards paying debts off um you know I wanted to try and get a bit of a, a buzz and an enjoyment from Cheltenham you know one of the biggest national hunt arguably the biggest race meeting in, in the world kind of thing so I, I was really looking forward to it and I wanted to again try and get that feeling of having a bet and, and trying to win some money um, and whatever money I had saved up was lost on the first day um, I applied for more loans for the Wednesday which was the second day and I managed to get um, an a thousand pound loan with a company um, that was all lost um, and just seeing I think the emails come through and the text and, and, and phone calls and just getting spammed from all these companies saying how much money I owed was a, um, a gentle reminder, if you like, of, of where this had gone to and, and where I was at in life and literally sitting pretty much here where I am now, crying to myself, wondering if this nightmare is ever going to end. And it, and it wasn't unless I faced up to my mistakes and admitted that I wasn't just a niggling problem and it wasn't something that could be sorted in a couple of weeks. I needed to admit to myself that what I was battling was serious. Um, and if I didn't get on top of it, um, it would, you know, it would kill me as, as sad as it is saying it out loud. And I, I think with Cheltenham, um, it, that's where it really tipped me over the edge. And obviously when I opened up um, just after, but it was, uh, as I say, like uh, the enjoyment for the sport was still very much there. Um, and I realized, especially in my recovery, that I was going to be able to hopefully try and get some kind of enjoyment out of it and, and really appreciate the sport for what it is without getting involved financially, if that makes sense. No, for sure, for sure. So um so talk us through that. <coughs> um talk us through only if you like, but the the conversation that you had with your parents. I mean I can imagine after bottling up for so many years, um I can't begin to imagine what that would have felt like, but you, I, yeah. I, I'd imagine it would have been a, an outpouring of emotion and, and, and what like, uh, whatnot. Sure. But, um, what, what did you say and how did you kind of deliver it? Yeah. So obviously, as you say, Alex, it was um, <clears throat> a huge weight off my shoulders. That's the, uh, it's the best way I can probably describe it. Um, keeping everything bottled up for so long and not speaking to anyone about it and not even uh, attempting to get any help um, at any point on this journey. Um, to then bottle it all up and, and then open it open it all up and, and get this weight off my shoulders to the people that I love the most was incredibly difficult. And I had this script almost planned out in my head um, of how I'd 
word it and how I tried to sugarcoat it and make out like it, you know, it wasn't that bad. And that's, again, that denial taking over. And I needed to be honest and honest with myself and honest with, you know, the people that meant the most to me. And, and that's what it was. And I sat down and I'll be honest, I couldn't really tell you what was said. Um, it just sort of all blurted out and came out all in one. And I was no sugarcoating whatsoever. I was um, very clear of the facts and what sort of money I'd lost and how long this had been going on for. And, and then touching on the, the borrowing side of things and the debts. And that was, I, I think, the killer for me because I, I wanted to move on and I wanted to uh, you know, try and restart and, and begin this recovery process of getting gambling out of my life. But the debts just were there. And, and there was no, I, I wasn't in a position myself to, to pay it off. So that was a real burden on me and, and, and being able to move on. But the conversation with my parents was was tough. And exactly as you say, there was emotions, there was tears. I think they were angry, not really angry that I'd got myself into this situation, but angry that I hadn't told them sooner. And I think that it was at that point where I realised as upset as they are, and I can see the damage it's caused to them, they all they wanted to do was help. And I, I knew from there that as difficult as it was going to be, I was willing to do anything I possibly could to, you know, press the restart button and, and, and really try and turn my life around from what was, you know, something that's so negative and try and turn it into a positive. Um, and it was from there, talking to my parents, um, we agreed actually on the day when I opened up that we were going to keep it between us three. Um, no one else was going to find out, no, no other family members, maybe a couple of close friends, but it wasn't going to go any further than that. And, and I was happy to do that. Um, you know, this was obviously something that was very personal, very private to me. And I also didn't want my mum and dad's friends finding out what opinions would they have, you know, on them kind of thing. Um, but there was, something still wasn't right. And it, and it was uh, that feeling of knowing that I'd have to go into work and carry on lying about my gambling and, and uh, go to some friends or go online and, and I'd have to keep lying and bottling this up and this wasn't right. And obviously I was terrified of telling my friends and telling family and, and, and coming clean on social media because I, at that point, I'd accepted that people were going to judge me. I was going to lose friendships over this. Um, but at that point, in the kindest possible way, I just didn't care. Um, I was at that point now where I'd, I'd opened up. It was a weight off my shoulders. and I was ready to give it my best shot to, to get better. Um, so taking to social media was tough, but... I did it in a very vague, uh, very vague way in terms of uh, pretty much said that I got into some trouble with gambling. I'm going to be taking some time away, um, that sort of thing. And the response from that was, uh, Jesus, it was incredible. Um, incredibly overwhelming. Support left, right and centre from friends, family, strangers, um, messages from people saying how brave I must have been. I'm thinking, I'm not brave. Like I'm you know, the worst person in the world for putting my parents through what, what I've had to put them through but then people sharing their stories with me and, and what they've been through and what their friends have been through and what they're currently going through like I'm th and, and asking me for advice like that was bonkers um and I, I couldn't really fathom it I couldn't wrap my head around it because obviously at this point I'd only days into my recovery but at this point I found I was being able to talk to people and, and help people come to terms with you know, and, and relate to people. And it was from there that I was really be able to, uh, able to begin this journey and, you know, and, and get to where I am today. And it's, it's been tough, but it's, it's been the best 12 months I, I think I've ever had. That's absolutely brilliant. And um, I can relate a lot to the, the feeling of, you know, having that weight off your shoulders, off your chest yeah. even, um, mm. and being able to speak to other people about it and things. Um, so a lot of people watching this might know that you're, you're, you're famed, if you like, for the horse racing tips that you were giving it at that point sure. on, yeah, on yeah. your Twitter feed. So, mm -hmm. um, was it was it to be expected? I mean, I'm be, I, perhaps being a slight slightly controversial, if you like, but tipping oh, sure. web, you know tipping website uh, or, or or site. Um, do you think it was par for the course, or do you think there was that extra kind of emotion in there? because you were tipping people and you didn't want to be seen to be kind of having your own problems as well. Was that kind of an extra layer, yeah. if you like? No, you've hit the nail on the head um, with the end bit, especially, as I say, it all started with um, just sharing some tips with friends in, in, in a couple of chats we had. And from them tips came previews, explanations as to why I'd back these horses. And again, just sharing with friends, not going anywhere on social media. But I realised again, like I spoke about before, that these winners were coming. But now. I wasn't just 
giving people names of horses. I was giving the name of a horse and telling you exactly why it's going to win and why I think it's got an upper hand, even though it's, it's priced at nine to one, for example. Um, and it wasn't technically fancied. And suddenly people were like, you know your stuff. Like, take to social media. Um, you might not have a huge following, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And that literally was it. I had about 80 followers on Twitter, um, all of which were my friends, um, all personal to me, that sort of thing. I started posting quite in-depth previews over, over social media, like I say, and it wasn't until Cheltenham 2019, I think, so going back a couple of years ago now, where things really started to take off. Um, it was on the Wednesday where I had a really nice treble that landed, um, and it was from there that this particular tweet that I'd put up started getting likes, started getting retweets, started getting um, loads of followers coming through. I even started getting betting slips sent to me, people that had backed the treble that I'd put up. And that was a, a realization of wow, people are literally taking my word, for, you know, and, and putting their own money into it. And that was crazy to me. And this was at the time the best thing that happened to me. But looking back, it was probably the worst thing because obviously when you retweet stuff, you like stuff, it gets round to other people. And I remember going to going to bed one evening, I had about seven hundred followers, which was crazy at the time, and I woke up with about two thousand. Um uh, several message requests. Uh, what have you got fancied for today? And and cut a long story short, that that's when things really started to go wrong because I felt this pressure. Um, people were all of a sudden following my tips and going off the betting slips, putting some quite serious money down on on, on you know what I was backing and what I was telling people to back. And again, this pressure almost of um, needing to find people winners. And I was always very conscious of keeping my keeping my bets at quite. Um, high odds I wanted to always go over six or seven to one but after a few losses I resorted to going down to shorter price trying to get that winning feeling back again and have something to celebrate um, and that's again when when things started to really go wrong for me and it was that that added pressure and exactly like you say Alex not wanting to let people down that I think really built up on me and and net, up, and net away at me and I as much as the problems were materializing I couldn't bring myself to to talk to anyone about this or take to social media and say that I'm taking some time away, you know, take the sensible approach almost. So I just kept eating away at it and going away at it and, and acting like the financial and the gambling side of things wasn't really happening. I was just keeping this passion for the sport sort of thing. And, you know, this 21 year old that knows his stuff. Um, and, and that's again, when, when things really started to go wrong and was it inevitable that it was going to happen? Um, honestly, I'd say not because I was, when I started, I was so mature and I was so responsible with my approach and having a staking plan and having limits in place, you know, in case things did start to go wrong. Um, because uh, as we spoke about, like my, my passion and enjoyment for the sport was uh, through the roof at that point. Um, and it was such a shame that the gambling eventually took over. Um, and it was a shame that the gambling, you know, ruined the love that I had for the sport. But that didn't stop me from watching it, although it might have been uh, sort of like a fake um, sort of put on fictional impression no for sure for sure um so adam a lot of people get in touch with me and they ask um questions like what was the one thing that made you stop gambling um and and then also where'd you get help so can you talk us uh, can you talk to us about that maybe the initial kind of um yeah what made you give up and then also what were the first few days so you've had this conversation with your parents what was the first few hours, the first day, you know, few days like uh, in that kind of aftermath, if you like? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, for me personally, in, in terms of what made me um, realise that I needed to get some help was I think more the emotional side of things now, the mental side of things have really kicked into the point where it was making me miserable every single day. And I was taking that out on my parents. And I think they noticed the mood swings and they noticed something wasn't quite right but I was always very quick at that point when I I feel like they had any suspicions to play it down and, and reassure them that everything was all right um, which again is, is sad looking back but that's that's the mindset I was unfortunately in but I think again as sad as it is saying it out loud um, with the loans and stuff I got to the point where I had about 14 outstanding loans um, all of which were in debt no repayments had been made so my credit score was you know, in the bin. Um, I couldn't apply for any more loans. I was getting declined everywhere. So I had no way of getting any finance. So that was when the thought of stealing came into mind. And not only did that thought come into mind, that was normal up there. 
and I was thinking of ways of how I'd be able to do it and that was uh, wrong on, on so many levels and that again saying it out loud is embarrassing but that's where I was at I was desperate um, and as I spoke about before I'd given up and I was willing to do anything to to put a bet on at that point and obviously having no money um, not being able to apply for loans that sort of thing um, I was at a loss and I, I wasn't really sure how I was going to be able to get any more money and when the thoughts of stealing came to mind, I knew that enough was enough. Um, and at the very least, if I could open up and at least show that I'm trying to get help, even though when I did open up, I was there was still a huge part of me that was so scared because all these urges and these temptations in the past that had got the better of me when I was trying to you know, be a bit more mature and take a step back, all these urges always got the better of me. And I was, as I say, so scared that I, I knew that I was going to revert back. And I knew that I was, I'd opened up now um, and I'd been given this second chance by not only my parents, but everyone was being so supportive and, and grateful of my recovery. I was frightened to death because I knew I was going to go back to it. And it was that motivation and, and, and knowing what I'd done to my parents and for myself wanting to get out of it. And, and I used that in them early days, like, like we're going to speak about, to, to get me through it. And in terms of getting help, I, I reached out. Um, several different people, companies, Gamcare. Gamcare were brilliant in that sense of, of that one-on-one -on -one support and just having someone to talk to and, and not only talk to but relate to. Um, and obviously the, the journey in the first couple of days was difficult. You've got to remember when I opened up in the 21st of March um, last year, it was only a couple of days after since COVID uh, lockdowns and stuff hit. And that was obviously um, a difficult time and that added more pressure because I went into work one day and I was told that I could either come into work and keep getting paid full, but I'd have nothing to do, or I could take furlough and get 80%, but I'd probably be off for three or four months. Um, and I'd like to say that it was a, yeah, definitely furlough, easy, easy decision. But uh, that thought of being sat at home bored with, with nothing better to do with my life, the boredom always got the better of me with gambling. Uh, and it was often when I was sat around with nothing better to do that I would revert to it. And, and obviously that's when, problems began but I took the furlough option and that's when I was determined to not be sat inside I was I not let my own thoughts get the better of me and that's when I started walking I started uh, running uh, things that I'd never done um, in my life before like I'd never used to go out with walks uh, never used to do any sort of physical activities but I was determined even though I didn't really want to do it or even enjoy it at that point I was determined to replace gambling with something else and that was really important for me and especially obviously in the early stages of of my recovery there was bad days and there was days where is this all worth it um I've gone a week without gambling it feels like a lifetime um I'm struggling big time I want to talk to someone but again it's that feeling of embarrassment even though I've opened up all these thoughts going on in the mind of uh, if I could you know, sneak away of gambling, I could maybe get some, you know, get some money and, and all these crazy thoughts when I knew how wrong it was would always try and get the better of me. And I was determined, we spoke a, a bit off air that there was a time where uh, the urges really got the better of me and I dropped everything and went out and walked out and went for a run. And I knew from that point that it cleared the head and it, it made feel so zen and uh, made me almost realise where I could go in life if I went through with this recovery and stuck by myself and you know kept loyal to the promises that I'd made in terms that I'd never go back to it and I didn't want to put my parents through that again and it was that that process especially the early days were were really tough but I was able to use the walking use the running um, and most importantly talk to people and be open and, and honest about my experiences online that really made me um, reminisce almost and made me realize that I never want to go back to to that person that I used to be and I, as I say, I use that as motivation and inspiration to, to get me through and, and get me through them, you know, the more difficult days. So you spoke about um, running, walking. Um, have you got any other kind of tips, if you like, for, uh, for the viewers who maybe want to fill that void of time? Sure. Yeah, um, it was, I, as you say, you said it yourself, fill that void of time and, and gambling often got the better of me in that void of time, um, even though I tried to, to steer away from it. But uh, for me, obviously, you can put restrictions in place, um, which which um, sort of bans that void of time. So restrictions such as gam stop, gam ban, um, 
um, debit card blocks. I know most online banks now do uh, debit card blocks. Um, for me, a big one was handing over finances to, to family, someone that I trust. You know, I, I couldn't trust myself anymore. Um, so I had to you know, go to the extreme in terms of restrictions. But filling that void of time was, was difficult. Um, and as I say, the physical activities, I guess, um, helped a lot. I wasn't seeing any sort of visual gains from it. Um, you know, I even start, I got myself some, some dumbbells and, and started doing some home workouts. And again, no, no visual impact, but it was filling that void of time and, and reading and, and even gaming and Netflix. It sounds so basic, I know, but stuff that gambling prioritised um, uh, in the past. And it was important for me to, to get that away and, 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 and bin that off almost. And that was you know, incredible. It'll be difficult. Like we spoke about at the start of the of the conversation, gambling. My life revolved around it, um, and it was and it literally controlled me to the point where it was, unfortunately, the root of all my problems. And I had to stay away from that. I had to, you know, with the use of restrictions and and getting support and stuff. That was, you know, something that had to be done, as difficult as it was, and and filling that void of time. I often spent filling that void of time just talking to people. And, and, and as I say, going to GAM Care or even sitting down and as I say, the people that were getting in touch through social media and stuff, sitting and talking with them and all of a sudden these people are sharing their own experiences of what they're going through or what they've been through. And again, I, was, I found that I was, almost my story was a carbon copy of theirs. And obviously, as you know yourself, Alex, everyone's story is unique um, and, and we all go through different things. But at the end of it all, we all have these same emotions and these same feelings of, of gambling and how it and how it grips us so talking about that made me I guess sort of realize that I wasn't alone uh, if that makes sense and that was important for me um, that was a big thing about opening up you know that fear of judgment um, and, and talking to people and talking about these bad times that we had so much in common really helped me in in my recovery. Absolutely I think um, the, there's a famous quote that says the opposite of addiction is connection and um, I mean, I just totally relate to that. Um, when you come out and tell your story, other people will um, naturally will, you know, you kind of connect with these people and it's just, yeah. it's just amazing. I mean, you have that shared um, connection as it, as it were, like you say, all the yeah. stories are unique, but you have that common ground. And um, mm -hmm. it's uh, in one of the podcasts, I spoke to um, a chap called Jeff and he says it was like finding people from the same part of the, pl uh, the planet um, as him. Yeah. Um, you know, after, after feeling for years, feeling so alone and feeling like I'm just so alien to everyone else. Um, mm -hmm. it's amazing to, uh, to be able to connect, connect with others. It is. 100%, um, yeah. So if I, if I'm right on this one, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, was sure. there a bit of a kind of a blip, um, a, a few weeks and months into it? Cause was there something I read on your Twitter page that was to do with an outstanding debt and, there was something overhanging and, and, and maybe you found that there was a bit of a tough period for you. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, um, as I say, with the debts, um, uh, when I was borrowing, I wasn't really keeping a track of, um, of what loans I was taking out. Cause obviously in, in that point, I didn't really care. I just wanted the money. Um, and obviously when I opened up and I spoke to my parents, um, something I'm very fortunate for that we, the first thing we did was try and, you know, get some repayment plans set up and, they were adamant that they didn't want that and they wanted to pay everything off in, in one clean swoop and get this all, you know, get this all sorted out. So it, it wasn't something that was, you know, sort of shadowing me for, for months to come, you know, whilst in my recovery. So um, they helped out massively. I contributed a, a, a bit of money that I had left to, to pay some of these loans off, but they put in an, an even bigger contribution to getting them paid off. So um, I'm still paying them back as I have been for the past 12 months and I'm going to be doing um, for however many months it is to come, but I'm more than happy obviously to do that in that sense but no the um when i when we got these loans repaid off i had emails through that said my account was cleared i had letters through that said accounts were cleared don't owe any more that sort of thing um and it had gone on now for eight or nine months um without getting any letters um any emails any texts from any of these companies saying that i'd, I'd missed something um and that's important that i address that because there was that many loans and you know, I didn't keep a track of anything. When we came to repay them, I was just going through old emails um, and going back over, um, you know, outstanding late repayment emails and just saying, right, that's a company, pay them off. That's a company, pay them off. Phone calls, um, trying to get 
like settlement fees, that sort of thing. So I was, although I didn't want to think like that, I was sort of concerned and, and almost adamant that it was going to be something that was had been missed along the way. Um, but obviously, as I'm, I'm sure you can imagine, eight or nine months down the line, none of these companies have got in touch. Um, I thought that was it. I thought that was clear um, until I had a letter through the door um, and I felt sort of my heart sink because um, I hadn't had that for so long and it took and it took me back to them days of hiding letters and putting letters in drawers to then build all the letters up to then take to work to put in the bin, that sort of thing, like, you know, just doing everything I could to, to keep it away from um, my parents. But I opened the letter. It was um, a debt that dated back to um, really early on in, uh, when the problems started to materialise. And it was a debt that had um, interest added up over the months that occurred to about £800. And... Um, and I was fortunate enough to be in a position where I could take eight hundred pound out of my savings um, and pay it off, and you know get it done there and then. But the first thing I did was go downstairs and said, "Look, this is um, a letter I've had through the post today." Um, that was tough, but that was huge for me in a way um, because this uh, honest approach that I'd um, claimed to have had in my recovery was quite apparent all of a sudden, and. In the past, I was always very quick to hide that sort of thing. And, and obviously, I could have. Of course, I could have. I had that letter through to me. My mum and dad didn't know about that letter. I could have easily paid that debt off, not mentioned anything on social media about it, and that would have been it. But that's, again, lying and, and deceiving, and I didn't want to do that. And, and it was important for me to talk to them and say, look, this is a, a reminder for me that my past is never truly forgotten about. And, and it was just... Um, yeah, don't get me wrong, get brought back bad times and, and, and seeing that letter and, you know, the threats of if you don't pay by this day, you know, court fees, all that sort of thing. Um, but no, very fortunate to be in a position where I could pay it off. But going down and speaking to my parents, I think they were just really grateful that I'd been able to go down and, and, and talk to them so honestly about that, which was obviously a difficult time. And I could have quite easily, you know, paid that debt off and, and sat where I am now feeling sorry for myself and reminiscing on them bad times and having these weird thoughts again that spontaneously um, occur where is this all worth it? Um, you know, why am I doing this? And, and that's when I have to, you know, take myself out again, like we spoke about. And if I don't take myself out, I can let the thoughts get the better of me. And you know, I'd like to think um, I wouldn't do anything stupid and touch wood. I haven't um, done anything stupid as of yet in terms of relapsing, but I know, uh, just how easy it is to slip back into old habits no matter how long you've been away from whatever habit it was so it's a case of keeping my mind occupied um, and yeah like I said the debt was was difficult to pay off um, but I was again fortunate enough to be in a position to pay that off and I was able to get through that weekend and and just start again and keep that positivity. So Adam um, this week it's been Cheltenham Festival 2021 mm -hmm. um, I believe you took the week off work to uh to watch um, the racing um, and how has yeah. it been I've, I've, I've sort of followed your updates closely um yeah how's 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 the week gone for you honestly Alex it's been great um it's a it's a week I've been dreading for months honestly um just because I knew how big of a test it'd be for me um you know obviously we spoke about earlier that I was um you know quite alien to horse racing when I first discovered it but Cheltenham kind of like the Grand National you always have a bet on it um and I would always stick a few quid on Cheltenham, um, you know. So uh, approaching that week was, I knew it was going to be difficult. Um, as you say, I booked the week off work, as I always would. Um, I was willing to watch it. I felt comfortable um, in, in terms of sitting down with friends and watching it, you know, um, speaking to them over the Xbox and stuff like that and, and having chats about um, which horse we think is going to win. And it, I felt comfortable in doing so. But on the other hand, um, I was... Um, very much aware of the fact of there's a big risk here um, you know and I, again I go back to I, I don't think I'd do anything stupid but I knew it was going to be a test um, and if I felt like at any point that the enjoyment wasn't there or the temptations for example were, were getting a bit too hot to handle I wouldn't have hesitated in taking a step back but that was you know sort of last resort um, and I didn't want to do that Tuesday came around which was the first day and I was a bit apprehensive and um, a bit nervous and I think quite rightfully took myself out for a, a nice long walk before the first race cleared my head and honestly just went through the seven races and I couldn't believe how much I enjoyed it um, and that meant something to me that really meant something and not only that speaking to friends and um, and they were like celebrating and cheering that they'd back winners and, and talking about what 
what races they'd bet in, and it didn't even bother me. And I, I, I don't know how it didn't, I don't know how it didn't affect me one bit. But that, again, meant so much to me that I, this week that I've been dreading for months, I'm now able to enjoy it. And I don't want anyone to get this idea that, um, obviously you can see that I'm, I'm really happy and I'm looking forward to, you know, the final day of it. But I didn't want anyone to think that I was going into Cheltenham with this. I don't know, kind of like a, an ignorant or, or selfish mindset. You know, I'm very much aware of the risk when I'm watching. Um, but as I'm sure you can relate to it yourself, Alex, only us ourselves are comfortable in our recovery and we know what we're comfortable with doing and, and what we're not comfortable in doing. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, people are, I think are very quick to judge when they discover that I'm a, you know, an ex-gambling addict, but here I am watching horse racing. Uh, that doesn't click with people. Um, and I get that. Of course I get that. Um, and everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But as I say, I feel comfortable in what I'm doing and racing is a big passion of mine. And whilst the gambling unfortunately ruined uh, that passion at one point, over the months I've been able to gain that back. Um, and there's no um, lies, there's no deceit in, in what I'm doing this week. Um, I'm very confident and very comfortable whilst watching. And again, that means something to me. Um, and I guess my page uh, and what I'm doing is you know, it's obviously it's raising awareness of the dangers of gambling, but it's also showing people that, you know, it is possible to enjoy, you know, your favourite sports without without that pressure of gambling. And that's important for me, I feel. So talking of which, um, I, lo- I love the the name, the fun stopped. I didn't. I think it's thank um, you. I think it's so apt um, with with where people <clears throat> get with the you know, gambling problems and crossing that. Well, to coin a phrase, that invisible line. To, to, yeah, to yeah. moves across sure. to, um, mm-hmm. to to an, uh, an addiction. Um, mm. I watched your at the races, uh, the Sky Sports um, video clip again for the viewers. If you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic clip. Um, I thought you spoke brilliantly, very honestly, um, and that really came across. And um, it made me a bit bit emotional at times because I just thought it was really really powerful. Um, yeah. And then I watched another clip of you with. I'm, I hope I'm going to get this right. Horse racing was never my thing, but um, Patrick Mullins, champion jockey. That's correct. Yeah, um, yeah. You got a shout out as well. Um, so, so tell us more about this because I'm again, I'm being probably really naive here. But is it something? Are you, do you own a horse? Am I right in saying that? Or well, tell us more about that situation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I've always been involved in in Millennium Racing Club, which is a syndicate set up by a couple of friends of mine, Josh and Joe. Um, and I guess that is my way of still having a bit of an involvement and an enjoyment towards the sport. And that's been brilliant. You know, um, we've got a couple of horses now, um, which I have shares in and it's been great. Um, one of them is still unraced and one of them um, has had a, a few runs under her belt and it was um, a couple of runs ago, uh, the beginning of the year where she won. And that was amazing. Um, but no, the, as you say, the, uh, the feature we've had the races was uh, an incredible opportunity. Um, I remember being sat here where I am with you now and I, I saw the message pop up on Twitter from uh, Vanessa Ryle, who I know after following racing is a, a Sky Sports presenter and I, I remember just freezing and thinking, why the hell is she getting in touch with me? Um, so to then read the message and realise what she wanted to do and um, you know, meet up, film a feature piece, it was going to be on the TV for the, uh, during uh, Safer Gambling Week during November was, I, I didn't know what was happening. I was at a complete loss. Um, I had all these questions getting sent through. We were going to meet at Doncaster Race Course only a few days after she'd sent this text. Um, amazing, absolutely incredible. And I knew this was my this was my opportunity um, to really, you know, get my story across. And you know, uh, I guess I, I don't, I, it was amazing. I, I can't. It was a huge moment for me. Um, and to get that opportunity was something I'm so grateful for. Um, and I was able to use that. And, and obviously, so many people saw that. People saw it on the TV, at the races, put it out themselves. Um, and that just increased the following. And that increased, uh, as upsetting as it is, people getting in touch um, and, and saying that they'd seen the feature piece. And, and, and sort of, as you say, sort of like an emotional impact. Um, and I'll be honest, a lot of people getting in touch saying, I didn't really know I had a problem. Um, but now I've watched your video. Some of the things you talk about is some of the things I do. So I just thought I'd drop you a message to let you know that I've put in restrictions and I'm taking a more sensible approach. That means something to me. And, you know, knowing that a video that I've been a part of has been able to have that sort of impact on someone um, is, is massive. And 
as I said about the Millennium Racing Club with the ownership, Josh Stace, he's a, a really good friend of mine and he's very much involved in racing, working with the Racing Post. Um, very proud of him in that sense. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to get to know Josh, um, mainly from the start of the tipping uh, sort of thing, you know, on Twitter and, and that sort of thing. And he's been incredibly supportive. Um, and he set up this call um, over Zoom where he said that he was going to post on his YouTube channel about responsible gambling and stuff. Um, and we were talking like, like me and you are now about my story and the, uh, enjoying horse racing. And all of a sudden, Patrick Mullins pops up. Um, he, he's not mentioned anything about it. I think if you saw the clip, like you say, you saw the surprise on my face. I didn't know what to do. Um, not even sure how I managed to string a sentence together at that point. Um, but seeing him on the screen was just... Um, amazing and hearing him you know speak so kindly and so positively about me and my recovery was again I'm, I'm not sure how I managed to sort of come back with a reply um, but it was amazing and it was a, a, a huge moment for me and Josh posted that on his Twitter and again um, the response from that was really positive and people got in touch through that and it's, it's been a, a whirlwind of emotions it's been a, a roller coaster um, but uh, again I'm very grateful to to these sort of opportunities that have been handed. That's absolutely fantastic. Now, um, it's it's just something's popped in my head actually, and it was uh, the first vlog that I did on YouTube um, was taken the day after my brother's uh, brother and sister's twenty first birthday, okay. and um, basically to give a bit of context, what happened was that there there was a group of lads. Um, one of the chaps' brothers um, is is a jockey. Um, based in Newbury, famed for the horse racing track, yeah. um, stables out in Lambourne and, and, and such like. And it was fascinating because I just started the Invisible Addiction and everything like that. And my girlfriend was there and they were all talking. They're all on their mobile phones. They were backing this horse. This, this horse was getting, yeah. you know, talking mm. it up. Even where I started, like, oh, yeah, I think it's definitely going to win here. You know, like it's that power of, well, everyone else is doing yeah. it. I'm a bit like a sheep now. Oh, it's probably going to win but mm -hmm. they were lumping on massive sums of money. Mm. Um, and it, I wasn't necessarily trying to dig, if you like, but the chap whose brother is the jockey, who um, it, it had a winner and, and such like, but they were just lumping on big money. And he was like, yeah, this right. is the, the stable. They're all going to be putting on a couple of grand or whatever. Mm. And we went yeah. into the room and watched it and it lost um, by... I, I don't know a, a furlong or whatever but um yeah yeah and, and there were people before the race they were like oh should i put more on and and just clicking buttons on their mobile phone and it was really it was really shocking to see a set of lads 20 21 um putting huge amounts of money on um so i don't know what your thoughts are on this i mean i suppose the question is you know horse racing that relationship with gambling it's almost like one with the other if you like yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, what you think about um, the relationship, you know, the relationship for young people on this one um, mm -hmm. and, and your thoughts on the, the horse racing industry with gambling and such like, yeah. Sure. It's more, more yeah. of a, an outpouring of, of thoughts there uh, <laughs> yeah, Adam, no, as opposed no, to a, a question. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I understand that. No. And it's a, it's a valid point that you raise and look, I won't lie. Um, Obviously, sports and gambling are linked, um, but there's no denying that racing is arguably, you know, the closest link to gambling. Um, simply because when you're watching it, the odds are popping up everywhere. You've got experts, um, you know, saying what they'd be back in, that sort of thing. So it, it's very heavily linked, and um, and I think that's that's why people raise eyebrows and alarm alarm bells go um, when they hear of an ex ex gambler watching racing and following it so closely. Um, and again, I understand that, and I. I think that's important for me to understand and just be aware of that. And, you know, you talk very well about, you know, that dangerous side of it. And, and I'm sure these lads that were putting um, this sort of money on didn't really feel comfortable in doing that. But they've got that word and they've got this, you know, quite a strong word potentially from a jockey that this horse is going to win. You do go out of your comfort zone. And, and I think, is that natural behaviour? I guess so. Um, if you've got such a strong word. and But it is it's that dangerous side of it that's something that can seem once upon a time to be so innocent um that can quickly you know spiral out of control like i'm sure you know yourself and it's it's that what i try and talk about take take this week for example there was a really well fancied horse called envoy allen who's um unbeaten in in eight or nine eight or nine runs 
and he was going into Cheltenham uh, yesterday. Very, very short price favourite. Um, obviously, throughout the week, I'd seen betting slips, um, accumulators, thousands and thousands of pounds lying on him to just pass the post in front. And that's all it took. And with the form he had, etc., it was um, there's no such thing as a bank room racing. I always like to, I always like to exaggerate that point, but he was just about as close as you can get. Um, and the only danger was defences, and he fell. Um, took to the floor, got back up, all safe. From a racing point of view, that's brilliant. But it made me realise how many potentially thousands of people across the world have been relying on that horse to win a, a, probably a, a very decent amount of money. And then the bet's gone. Um, what do you do in that point? You get angry. You chase your losses. You go out of your comfort zone to stake more to try and get that money back. Um, you know, you're in touching distance of getting, you know, from the betting slips I saw. <clears throat> potentially life-changing money um so i know that feeling of, of anger and you know being so close to that sort of money that you then chase your losses and and up the stakes and whatever but that's powerful um and and that made me realize you know on the tuesday there was plenty of favorites that went in and everyone was saying you know the bookies have been bashed that sort of thing but thinking in the back of my mind there's going to be a couple of days where a few favorites get beat and you watch you know they'll they'll soon be laughing and they'll soon have that money back in their pockets and you know that's a shame um, I guess in in that sense because that's that irresponsible side of of gamblers and I know looking at people now um, and seeing people posting winning betting slips that there's going to be a lot of them that are not going to take that money out and are going to use that towards gambling. Don't wrong, there's going to be a lot that are going to take the responsible side and treat themselves and whatever. But it is a powerful relationship and the two are so closely linked and that's why I've got to be careful um, and I do understand that. Um, and, it, and it obviously goes back to what I was saying about being comfortable in my own recovery um, and, and knowing that I'm comfortable with watching and, and obviously uh, I play a dangerous game in the sense that of course I look at a race on, uh, during Cheltenham and I think about what horse I think is going to win um, and obviously if I'm looking at a race and I think a horse is going to win and it goes on and wins what does that do to me and how does that affect me because obviously that I think the natural way of thinking is oh god what if I'd had some money on that um, which, again, I think it's quite a natural thought and you can quite easily let them, let them thoughts get the better of you. But for me personally, I, if I have thoughts like that, I think if I'd have won that money, I'm only then going to lose it on the next few races and it's only going to get worse and it's going to go more from there. And that's my way of dealing with it. And everyone has, of course, different ways of, of dealing with it. And look, watching sports, especially horse racing, when you've previously had problems with gambling, isn't for everyone. Um, and I get that. And if anyone's watching this now, it doesn't agree. Um, with what I'm doing I'm more than happy for you to get in touch and, and, and sit down I'm be more than happy to relay any information that you need to you know sort of back up my point and I, it's quite unique what I do in that sense and, and that's why again eyebrows are raised and alarm bells um, get rang but I understand that um, but I just want people to know that I'm very careful I'm very cautious in what I'm doing just because I'm enjoying the week of Cheltenham doesn't mean that I've took uh, the guard down if you like you know I'm still very much going into it approaching it with caution um, and, and that's all you can do when you I guess treading on thin ice um, You touched on um, the, the horse there the favourite that, um, that fell there's something going around at the moment it's been shared on WhatsApp like you wouldn't believe and Twitter and such is, is it that, um, that chap that had a, an accumulator or whatever it was and on the bet fair was it that was it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't it something like he cashed out or I can't remember. I, I believe he, um, he took some, I think you can do like a partial cash out. Um, right. Um, so he took a certain amount of money, left it. I, I think he took, if I remember right, he took a, a lot of the what the cash out was offering and left a bit riding on it. Um, and obviously, um, yeah, the horse fell. So what would what would have happened to him if he you know, didn't cash out and let it ride. Mm. Um, it's a, a dangerous thought in that sense. Mm. Mm. I was going to say, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great PR for the bookies at this point. Um, yeah. It makes it look like it's, it's kind of easy or, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. ev everyone can win. Everyone can win, you know, half a million, quarter yeah. of a million or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's good PR for the, for the bookies. Um, mm. So, Adam, what are your thoughts, actually, just, just quickly on this, um, slightly off topic, but um, on horse racing, what about the whole Gordon Elliott thing uh, about the, the horse, the, the photo, 
Um, yeah. I mean, I was pretty shocked. I probably got caught up in the, the, the emotion of it and I thought it was yeah. really shocking. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I'll be honest. Um, I first saw the photo and I, I instantly decided it was fake. Um, Gordon Elliott, for anyone that isn't aware in, in horse racing, is one of the biggest Irish trainers, if not um, UK trainers. Um, been around for a very long time, very respectful man. Um, always comes across well in interviews, that sort of thing. So I saw that photo posing, sat on a dead horse, you know, on the phone, thumbs up kind of thing, like the Churchill pose. And yeah, it's got to be fake, obviously. Um, there's no, you know, seriousness to this. This is someone playing a joke. Um, but then, obviously, yeah, through some lads and we were sort of like zooming in on the photo and we zoomed in and there was a bit of a, a blur in the image. There was a part of his leg that was a bit crooked. Um, his elbow was flat. There was um, a bit of a leg on the horse that didn't quite look right. And everyone was like, yeah, obviously, like, it's good effort. I went wrong, you know, really good effort in Photoshop, but it's fake. Um, and I decided at that point it was fake. And then he came out with a statement saying that he was working with the IHRB um, and he didn't deny it. Um, and I was sort of um, like a bit scared at that point because I was thinking he'd come out with a Obviously, you have to, you know, wait a few days for a statement. But I was sort of ex expecting him to just come out and say, this isn't real, um, that sort of thing. Something along them lines. But he didn't. And he just said that he was working with them um, to resolve this case. And everyone, I think, was like, wait, what? What do you mean you're working with them to resolve it? And, and it was obviously of a time where the statement came out and, and it was true. Uh, and the photo was real. And I couldn't really grasp my head around it. Um, just embarrassing for the sport, uh, disappointed um, for someone of his, you know, like prowess and, and size in the sport to do something like that. But I think it'd be different if he'd have been sat on this horse and looking down and not aware that the photo was taken. But for me, the big part was the posing, um, almost like some kind of hunter would when you, you know, and that's and that's what it looked like and. The way I saw that situation, yeah, the photo was a couple of years old, but he saw that photo being taken. Surely, when that photo was taken, he'd have gone up to the guy or whoever took it and be like, yeah, that's great and that. Just, yeah, delete it, would you? But that's obviously not happened. But, I mean, the events that happened from that in terms of, like, um, everyone was expecting him to have a you know a lifetime ban, never to be involved in the sport again. Um, whereas now he's got a, a one-year suspension um, I can't remember exactly what fine it was. I think it was fifteen thousand pounds. I think it was terrible punishment. Um, a year ban. Bearing in mind that now he's had a lady called Denise Foster that's taken over his uh, horses. So all his horses are running at Cheltenham um, under a different name. So he's got a fifteen k fine to pay. Which bearing in mind, day that punishment came out, he had a treble that landed um, over in Ireland. So I bet that fifteen k fine was paid. Um, from them three horses winning. Um, people were up in arms um, at the punishment that was handed out. But then he released a statement um, and it was sort of like a sympathetic, um, not in terms of feel sorry for me, but, you know, we all make mistakes, um, which is, is a very true point. And we're all human. Um, and whilst his mistake is, you know, very much the lowest of the low in that sense, um, you know, he's never never really done anything like this before. So people were, I guess, although disappointed, um, willing to forgive, um, you know, going to serve his punishment, whatever. And I think just for the nature of the sport, that you know, that had to be done because uh, this was obviously massive news and, and no one had seen anything like this before. But no, just a, a general reaction, which was really disappointed. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Gordon Elliott was the uh, the trainer of, you know, Tiger Roll, who... Yeah. Um, had, had a big win um, a couple of years ago and I remember it well it was um, my friends had been back in it all year and yeah. uh, it came in and he won a lot of money um, mm -hmm. off all these free bets and such like and um, I again I, 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 I can't get my words up I echo what you <laughs> I echo what you say um, with regards to almost being jealous of people that can stay in control because he was like look I'm going to be, yeah. I'm never going to get a win like this ever again. Like that, yeah. I've reached my peak. Um, but conversely, what are your thoughts? Um, I suppose I'm doing a little bit of digging here, Adam, but what are your thoughts on um, 
uh, gambling companies or operators closing winning accounts or suspending winning uh, winning accounts because in his case he's found exactly that um what are your yeah. thoughts do you think that's ethical i think it's disgusting it's the, um they like robbery um in that sense you know they're very very happy in my personal experience i um gambled a lot with paddy power that was my main account um and whilst i was gambling thousands and thousands of pounds at the age of you know, 21, 22, I never got one email of, um, you know, need to be careful, here's some restrictions to put in place. The only time I ever got emails was if I went on a couple of days winning streak and all this money that I'd lost, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds, I was slowly but surely trying to build that back up because I had a couple of winners and they were very quick to put in restrictions saying that I could only bet um, a fiver on this race, um, I could bet 20p on that. And that was like, wow, um, the whole idea of gambling um, if you look at it from a responsible point of view, is to beat the bookies, and um, I think everyone would admit that in the long run they're down. But in that session, it's always nice to get an upper hand. But imagine winning in that session to then get a, a notification on your account the next day saying you can't gamble anymore. Um, crazy! It, it, it seems mad saying it out loud. How how are they allowed to get away with it in that sense? Um, you know, literally, they like robbery. Um, they're more than happy to take money off you, whether it's responsible or not. Um, but as soon as you show any sign of winning and taking that money back, they're not happy. And I'd like to think that's just one or two bookies, but obviously um, being so active on social media around horse racing, you see it all the time. Restrictions on accounts from several different bookmakers. I think it's disgusting. Are you okay for time, Adam? Are you okay with just maybe like another 10 minutes maybe? Yeah, absolutely fine. Yeah, great, great stuff. Yeah. Um, so talking about gambling operators and such like, um, in your opinion, how would you make gambling safer? Gambling can, I think, can easily be made safer by just promoting a stronger message um, and, and I guess truly understanding from a lot of people's personal experience, you know, what sort of impact it can have when, you know, them, them initial signs and that damage, you know, really starts to occur. Um, I think, obviously, you know, looking at the big step, which I know you've been involved in in the past, that's a huge, that's a huge message. Um, you know, football sponsorship is targeted at, uh, at that more vulnerable, um, that more vulnerable age, you know, younger generation, people that probably don't even know what gambling is. Um, but obviously growing up and uh, being surrounded by football and seeing gambling sponsorships and not only sponsorships, but obviously, as you know, yourself plastered all the way around the football pitch. Um, uh, football club accounts on Twitter, Arsenal spring to mind are really bad for it in terms of putting out um, Alabama Yang's got a great chance at scoring. Click this link below to back him at an extended price of eight to one. You think of the thousands of kids that have you know seen that link and obviously you'd like to think um that them kids wouldn't be able to click on that link but that brings me on to something that just sprung in my mind um a good friend of mine paul who works for gam talk uh, i'm sure you've heard of himself did a video on instagram the other month where it was um he gave his i think it's his 12 year old nephew um access to his debit card his 12 year old nephew set up an account uh, through I can't remember what bookie it was, to be honest. Um, put in like fake date of birth, made out like he was over 18. Um, they accepted the account and he was allowed to deposit £10. Um, and that was like, wow, there really is no boundaries. There's no checks. There's nothing. Um, and I remember a story myself where, um, again, someone was, I think, 17, uh, made an account, made out like they were 18, no checks, won a bit of money. Um, off whatever they deposited, tried to withdraw that money, instantly needed ID checks, bank statements, um, several proof of um, like date of birth. And obviously he couldn't provide it because he was 17. So he, he lost the money. And, and how is that allowed? How is that possible? How can they take money off you? But then when you want to take some money back, that's not allowed. And that was another reminder, I think, and another realisation that, just how sick these companies are and like almost like prey on the vulnerable um but no going back to your point of how gambling can be made safer i mean that's not a good start in itself um almost like they're out to you know get that people and obviously yeah the long run the intention is they're out there to take money off punters you know i get that that's that's the game that's you know that's how it is but like behavior like that is just completely wrong um in my opinion and i 
gambling can only be made safer when that sort of thing is ironed out. And, you know, I think it's a great community that we're involved in that promotes that, you know, very powerful message of, you know, this is the dangers you can get in. But also, on the other hand, our recoveries, you know, are, are the best. And, that, you know, we don't want people to get, we don't want people to make the same mistakes that we did, basically. And, you know, doing what you're doing and doing what I'm doing is hopefully just reaching out to that right audience and making them aware of, of the dangers. So, um, so how would you say, let's kind of like, look, let's project forward. How have you been able to kind of change your mindset from having gambling problems, um, being deep in an addiction and mm. then coming out on the other side? Um, yeah, how have you been able to change your mindset and, and look forward? Yeah, obviously it's, um, it's been difficult, especially with lockdowns and stuff. That's been a, a huge test in that sense, not being able to see friends and see family. Obviously had regular Zoom meetings and, and that's been nice to see everyone. But in terms of, of getting through um, the recovery, um, merely a case of, as I said, clicking that reset button and, you know, gambling, as I say, was something that really had a grip on me um, and, and really controlled my life. And I think seeing what it did to my parents and, uh, you know, opening up and seeing just how upset they were and how much that had affected them was enough for me to at least know and promise to myself that I'm going to put in 110% to get out of this spiral, um, despite how difficult it may be. And, and you know, I, I, I tend to be careful in, I know I've used the word again, but sugarcoating things. And I don't like to give this impression that, you know, if you're wanting to take gambling out of your life, and you want to start recovery. If you do this, this and this, then you'll be fine. Because it, it isn't really like that. Um, and as I say, lockdown has been tough, but it's also given me a chance to, have a lot of time to myself and, and reflect on them bad times and not reflect in the sense that I get upset and I um, reminisce and, uh, you know, go back to old habits, that sort of thing. Obviously, uh, looking back at my past is, is upsetting. Um, you know, uh, knowing I can't change the clocks and, uh, and turn time back to do things differently is, again, even more upsetting. Um, and I spoke earlier about, you know, knowing myself when my gambling went wrong and, and just wishing that I could go back and tweak a couple of things to, to make sure it didn't go wrong. And, you know, that's looking back on the past and, you know, there's no point in doing that whilst you, you, know, you can't forget about the past. It's always there. But I use my past as motivation to, to keep me going and, and knowing the work I'm doing is, you know, potentially helping other people out there um, come to terms that they've got an issue. And I'll be honest, Alex, a lot of people have got in touch, um, especially over Cheltenham Week. Um, basically to get my advice and, and the end question they have is, am I addicted? Um, and they'll give me a couple of lines on, you know, how their gambling works and, and whatever. And, and I think that's in, in the weirdest possible way, brilliant to see because that's people taking that, that sensible approach. Um, obviously that's where very different conversations come in with these different people, but to, to know that people out there are having a sensible approach and, and using, as I say, what, what you're doing and what I'm doing to have that uh, responsibility, you know, and keeping that intact is really important. And for my, my own recovery, um, I think I've used, I know it's not for everyone again, but opening up on social media for me was, was important. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I don't take pleasure in talking about my past or, or touching on, you know, going into quite um, key detail on, you know, the things I've been through, but, I know it's that honest approach that you know oh so well yourself that can often be that that golden key almost to helping people, you know, realise their own issues and not maybe not even their own issues, but friends, family, you know, that they've seen signs of, you know, that sort of thing, whether it's borrowing money or mood swings, that sort of thing. And I think it all comes together in the end to to make a really powerful message. So talking of your page then, um, where can people find you on uh, on social media? Sure. Yeah. So I'm um, very active on Twitter and my username is Adam underscore TFSID. I'm also active on Instagram. I do um, little videos over there every now and then. Um, I'm pretty sure the username is the same over there. Uh, the Facebook page that I've got going on is, is called The Fun Stopped I Didn't. Um, the blog, uh, the page is, is something I set up um, just after my 23rd birthday last year, which was just after December. Um, and that was basically me uh, doing what I've been doing for the past eight or nine months, but taking it from my personal account um, and making a, a blog of it. And, you know, I'm hopefully in the future wanting to get into podcasts, YouTube, whatever, but 
for now, I'm I'm just really happy in you know enjoying enjoying my recovery, if, if if you can say that, and you know doing my little bit to potentially help other people. Um, and yeah, the response from it has been has been brilliant. And again, sound like a broken record, but ever so grateful for for all the support, and and even more grateful for sitting down and having a chat with you. Well, Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on um, as a guest. It's uh, you're welcome. It's been, Thank you. Oh no, it's been it's been great to hear your story. Um, is there anything else you want to add finally or, or anything that you want to touch on that maybe you think, oh, I, haven't, I don't believe so. No, I feel like, I feel like we've had a good discussion there. Yeah. It's been, it's been great. Well, um, yeah. Nice one, Adam. Well, thank you so much. I can't do this. I usually do this on the podcast where I go, I'll see you later. And then, and it's, and then no one will know that because it's audio. And, and I just realized we're on a video, so I can't do this. I'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness yeah <laughs> absolute buffoon yeah yeah this is really really professional you know well done yeah um i love it i've got to go through with it i can't just have my hands up like this now all right adam well thank you so much um <laughs> you're welcome i'll speak, I'll speak to you soon, <laughs> yeah, speak to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear oh that's goodness. gonna be a good ending